It's perfect. I'm on a I'm on an old person chair as well, so we can be old together. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao, this is Strano Podcast, an independent podcast supported by Spreaker Prime. My name is Ame, and I always felt weird, strange, my entire life. This podcast is my journey looking for other people that feel like me or felt like me or that can at least give me an interesting point of view on that. Doing this podcast, I get the chance to talk with people that do things that I like, people that play or played in bands that I love, and today's episode make no exception. Okay, I want to start with a memory of mine. My guest is a drummer. He used to play in a band that I first heard in uh, 2001, so more than 20 years ago, on something called MTV. I saw a video of their first hit single, a song called Fed Leap. The band was Sum 41. I couldn't understand more than a few words in the lyrics back then, But I mean, still, it arrived straight to my brain and made it explode. The melody was so catchy, the music was so powerful, the video was so fun, and the drumming, the drumming was so good. Time passes, life goes on, and even if my guest is not in that band anymore, those drums on those old records still sound basically perfect to me. I've got more than a bunch of questions for him, so let's do this. My guest today is Tivo former drummer for Sum 41, and more in general, if you ask me, one of the best drummers ever in punk rock. I really think so, and I really wanted to make him cringe with my compliments, so now we can start. Hi, Steven, thanks for being on my podcast. Well, thank you. I I love a good cringy intro. That's nice of you to say. (laughs) (laughs) That's my job. (laughs) <laughs> All right, so you, you want to talk about being yeah, weird. Who's weird? You, you feel weird. You felt weird. Okay. So what's the first yes. question is whether I feel My, weird? Yes, that's the first thing I'm going to ask you. Like, have you ever felt weird or, or strange, different from the other people? And if yes, did it affect uh, your music and more in general, w- what you do and what you did in your life? <sighs> I mean, I guess people always said I was kind of strange. My mom says I'm weird all the time. Uh, I think I'm perfectly normal, and I think other people are strange. But I do <laughs> think that all of us have some kind of like social discomfort. Or I wouldn't go for me. I don't think it's anxiety, but it might be in a sense. I, I don't think of myself as an anxious person, but like a discomfort with other people, and so you kind of create a buffer. And some people do an introverted thing, and they just go shy and don't talk. And I don't know, I mean, it's partly my entire family's personality because we're all talkers and we're all loud. But in some ways, I feel like it's a way to kind of control the the room. You know, if I make everyone else uncomfortable, I feel more comfortable somehow. But, you know, I don't know if I'm weird. I think some people would certainly say that I'm a bit weird. I don't think I'm as weird as some of my friends, but maybe I'm up there. Um, I would say... A little bit more weird than the average person. But not to the point where I think that it's detrimental all the time. I don't think it's like a painfully uncomfortable condition. Although sometimes, you know, after, because I, I do, I'll talk to people and I'll say things. And I tend, like I try to make people laugh. And I often go just one step beyond the line. And then the drive home when I'm alone with myself, that's when I'm uncomfortable. I'm like, I can't believe you said that. You idiot! Like, that that happens with fairly frequent regularity. But I don't think of myself as being, like, painfully weird. But other people might have a different yeah. opinion. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that, that's actually a great answer. That's a great answer, yeah. And so, the scariest or most dangerous thing you've done as a child or as an adolescent? Well, we've had a few. I mean, when we're in the band... First thing that pops in my head is the Congo thing was probably the most scary real life. This is society crumbling, everything, you know, we're all going to die type of situation. You know, I mean, we weren't involved. We just happened to be there. Okay, let me pause this and say something for anyone who's listening to this podcast and doesn't know what Steve-O is talking about. In 2004, 
Psalm 41 joined War Child Canada and traveled to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Well, the story culminates with the band under siege in a hotel room, taking shelter in bathtubs as wearing militias bombard their surroundings. Uh, Canadian peacekeeper Chuck Pelletier helped Psalm 41 evacuate from DRC. He is the reason why the band decided to call uh, Chuck their 2004 album, by the way. It is all narrated in uh, Adrian Callender's documentary titled Rocked, Psalm 41 in Congo. Back to the episode now. Um, that was scary because it was so different from what you regularly perceive as a normal situation. Like, if everything's completely out of control. The rules of law are no longer, you know, apply. So that was literally a dangerous situation that could that we were just fortunate to not, um, you know, have ended up at the business end of an AK-47 or something like that, just by sheer luck. So that pops to my mind. Another one would just be in general, back in the day when we used to just party so much. I mean, that could have easily ended up, you know, bad out of out of chance. Um, you know, one too many drinks, just one too many whatever. Like, it's not like there hasn't been a unfortunate history of people who have came before us who have succumbed to just having too much fun. And I think back of certain times where I'm like, oh, that was like really dicey, or you end up, staying just a little longer at the after hours bar and like uh, the, the more seedy characters, you know, are, are the ones still there. Um, that could have gone bad. And I'm fortunate that we sort of dodged that. So that's kind of an in general thing. When I think back how lucky we were that we, nobody OD'd, nobody ended up like any number, John Bonham, whoever. That could have easily happened because we all partied way too much back in the day. And that leads us to the next question, actually. Sum 41 got huge in 2001, uh, which are first uh, hit singles being played literally everywhere, all around the world, basically. And that was just the beginning. And you guys were pretty young when it all started. How did you survive that? I mean, I guess you also had a blast and I'm sure it must have been a lot of fun. But still, I'm pretty sure it must have been a lot of pressure and stress as well. Was it... Did you expect that, and how how did you manage that? When the band first started, it, we were so young. I think for me, I can't speak for anybody else, but I was just so stupidly naive that I was just like, when I think back of it now, it's amazing how many things just happen to fall into place. You can have the personality and you can have the music, but if you get the wrong A and R guy, you sign with the wrong label, you get the wrong manager, you you make the wrong video, you make any misstep along the way and the whole thing could fall apart and it just happened that everything worked out in this sort of beautiful once in a lifetime kind of fluke and so very early on I mean I don't think we were thinking about it too much I mean maybe there was a little bit of anxiety uh after fat lip before in too deep because you know everybody's wondering whether or not they're, they're just gonna have the one hit and I remember you know, the interview video, which I hadn't seen in like 20 years. Uh, I did watch it the other day. I can't remember why I watched it, but it did come on. I was like, it's actually funny. Like, it's a really funny video. It's not my favorite song by us, but it's the song's fine. But the video is hilarious. And for that time, it was great. But there was a moment when 9-11 happened, they were taking all these songs off the radio. And we were like, oh, my God, is like, in, like is there anything in that? Like, songs that weren't even that offensive given the sensitivities of the time we were just like in too deep is what does that mean that we like is this are they gonna take it off the radio and even that didn't because the song is like squeaky clean like that was fine like it just took off of the time the early stuff up until the chuck like everything just seemed to work everything worked i was never anxious i for me personally i wasn't anxious i just thought yeah this is what we do this is great this is awesome you know, as time went on, I think it, it, the challenges came about because it's not perfect forever. But in the early days, it was just, let's have fun. We were all young and in it together kind of thing. Like, we all got along. We were just like four friends having fun. So it was like, it was easy. I mean, it, I just expected that to be the way it was, you know. <laughs> 
Because we all like to bust each other's balls, and I come from a family where they, they sort of bust your balls a bit. So, like, there was no, like, ego. You just get cut down. You know what I mean? Like, we were kept in check and left relatively, I think. I mean, there are times, looking back now, that I was like, ah, oh, what an arrogant prick I probably was at that time or whatever. But in general, I think we were able to stay somewhat grounded because we, we could keep each other in check with jokes and stuff like that. And so I think that's how we got through it. And just sort of maintained a lighthearted nature. How old uh, were you when uh, it all exploded in 2001? I mean, I was probably 18. I think, well, we started the band when, in 1996. I was probably 15. And then within two years, because now like, I've been sort of poking around for nostalgia. I've just been like, oh, what was going on? It's, stuff's been coming on my YouTube. And we played a show on this TV show. It was our first live performance on this like canadian show called jonavision and we had a demo by then and that was 1998 so within two years we already had a demo I, the song wasn't half bad there was a different lineup it was me derek this guy john marshall and i don't know who's on bass twitch maybe uh who's rich roy he was the bass player for a while but we were on this show we would have maybe had a manager by then And so after that, around 1999, so within three, four years, we'd already sent our demo out to labels. We did an EPK, so like a video press kit, and that's what got us the most attention. That happened within three or four years. And so by the time I was 17, we were kind of doing showcases for major labels. And we got signed, and I was 18. And then by the time Fat Lip came out, I must have been 19. So a very long-winded answer, but I think I was probably 19. Okay. So pretty young. I mean, I still, I lived with my parents. I didn't have a car. I didn't, couldn't drive. I couldn't do anything. Wow. So, and then, like, 17 years after joining the band, so in 2013, you left, Sum 41. How did you find the bravery to make such a hard choice? How was switching from playing in a worldwide famous band to start looking for a job again? Uh, I mean, I don't know if it was bravery in the sense. I just think I was really burnt out. And I had a baby at home. So I just, in my head, I wanted to focus on that. So it just seemed like that's what I needed to do. And it seemed like the right time. I'm glad I did it because now my kids are, you know, my son's almost 13 now. So... The other one's nine, but, you know, I've been there the whole time, so I'm pretty happy. I left when I was 17, pretty much. You know, it's almost over this thing that he and I have going in this stage it's at now. So it wasn't so much bravery or anything like that. I just, I personally was burnt out and needed a break, and I just had to stop. And then I had family obligations that I felt were more important at the time, so I wanted to focus on that. So it was basically, I felt I was almost not obligated, but I felt it was the right thing to do to just focus on him and my wife and my other kid that came along. What would you say to someone who's having a hard time making a big choice or change in his or her life? Well, it depends. Because sometimes like, sometimes choices are easy. Like, <laughs> you know, when we were younger, I felt like I didn't have to make very many big choices because I hadn't done anything yet and I didn't have anything to lose. As you get older, it's harder because you've got a few things going on. And I think the most practical thing you can do, and it's not even that exciting, like if you are going to make a big decision, make a pros and cons list, write everything out, be honest. Like don't pad one, be brutally honest. Maybe even take a couple days and then look at it and then see which one makes the most sense. And Sometimes you're going to make a decision that even if it's the right decision, it's going to make bad things happen. But that's just the way it is. Those bad things make you harder. They make you more mature. They turn you into a better adult than, you know, human being in general. Like, not every decision is going to be easy. But sometimes the right decision is the shittiest decision. But it's the one you need to do for whatever reason. So don't be scared of it. In the long run, hopefully it'll work out. Sometimes the brutal truth is the right decision to you may be the worst choice of the two, right? But that's life. That's just the way it is sometimes. So, because I've not only the band, but I mean, we've moved to Australia. We used to live in America. 
I married somebody who is from Australia. I have family on the opposite side of the planet. Our kids are born in America. Like we're all over the place. So even the biggest, most recent decision I made has nothing to do with music at all. It was like, what country do we want to live in? And so we ended up going to Australia during the pandemic, but we had to do, we wrote the list down, you know, and uh, sort of looked at it and thought, okay, what's going to be the best thing? And when you're a parent, you know, sometimes it has nothing to do with you anymore. It's like, what's going to be the best option for the kids? So, you know, that's what we did. You know, you just try and weigh everything and, and make a rational, unemotional choice. That's a great suggestion, actually. It's simple, but it's perfect. I mean, I, it's not something everyone would think of. So, And the other thing I would say is uh, try and have a good support network when you're going through whatever you're going through because there's going to be times when, you know, you feel lonely or isolated. And if you've just got somebody that has an unbiased, impartial, it can be a friend or, or you know, if you have a therapist or whatever, somebody that you trust that you can go to that's important because if you're just doing it alone you know you can kind of feel like you're lost in the fog you know hopefully either way i think you know you, you, it'll be fine if, if <laughs> like life goes on and it, it'll be fine don't worry i say it'll be fine but yeah sometimes yeah. decisions suck that's just the way it is so you are in Canada right now, right? Canada, visiting my parents' house. So if you've ever seen the Sum 41 Cribs episode, this is the house. They never moved. So it's <laughs> I did. I did. And I, I actually often talk about that. I often quote that because I was so impressed by the fact that when they ask you, what's the thing you like the most about your room? You take those Iron Maiden CDs box set and show them to yeah. the camera. And that's really something I relate to. That was me, I was 20 years ago. I don't have that thing anymore. I don't think I own any CDs. It's all online now, but <laughs> at the time, very important, yeah. But it was a funny uh, experience, that whole thing. I mean, people bring that up to me all the time. And it was, I think it was our a &R guy, <laughs> Louis Largent's idea to do it at my parents' house. Because we still lived at home. I mean, we got signed when I was 18. And I just went on tour. And we were just mm -hmm. living in a bus for forever. And so all my stuff was still at home. So I still technically lived at home. I just hadn't been there in a really long time. I loved it. Yeah, that one's I funny. It. And I also like the Red Man did one, I think, at his friend's house. And that one's great. Uh, there's a few funny ones. Because we were on Island Def Jam. So a lot of the hip-hop artists on Def Jam were doing them, and we found out that a lot of them were just, like, renting houses and pretending really? they were their houses. Wow, so that's like, crazy. Oh, that's what we heard. So I was like, let's do it at my mom's house. <laughs> that one is for sure the best one because, like, everyone was showing, like, their super yeah. big cars and pool and, you know, and stuff like that, and that was just the best. This is my room. I live with my parents. I don't I have a car. I can't drive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks for bringing this up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, that's the house so, I'm in right now. Great. What's something you discovered or rediscovered after quitting the band? Maybe something you couldn't have done if you stayed in Sum 41. I mean, in some ways, when you've been in a band, and I'm not speaking for anybody else. I'm speaking for me. When you've been in a band since you were 14, 15, and then you get signed... And then you go on tour and all you do is the bands. Like, I didn't know, how, like, I didn't know how to do anything. Like, I had a tour manager. Like, I, I you know, I didn't know how to fill out a check. You know, I, <laughs> there's just certain things that I, you know, maybe I probably would have developed them anyway. But, you know, I was almost sort of frozen as like a, a grown child or something. And so after leaving the band, having kids and being married and you do mature a bit, one would hope. So there's just being an adult like i'm still a twit and a goof and all those things but i've had to actually rise to the occasion and like be the adult in the room from time to time and maybe that wouldn't have happened as much if i was still just the drummer of a band i don't know maybe it would have i don't know but i, I was able to just kind of mature a bit and, and do my own thing which i think is help for personal growth in 2023 you started playing drums again I saw that on the Instagram. I've been looking for you for like years. 
where did Steve-O go? You know, because you were not on the social media, I think, or I didn't find you. And I was curious to know what happened to you. And I saw in 2023 that you started to play drums again. And so I want to know, how did you know it was the right time to do it? Is it fun like it was back then? Or maybe it's even more fun or less fun? I don't know. Well, I started playing again during the pandemic. So we moved to Australia and we had a house that had a basement. So I was like, maybe I'll put a drum kit down there. And I did. And then I realized like I was like, I didn't play at all. I might have, I played three shows with the Vandals. That's three punk band from California who are friends of mine. But aside from that, I didn't play at all. I didn't practice. I didn't have practice pad. I didn't have a drum kit. I didn't play at all. And then when we moved, I thought, oh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start playing again. And then, you know, in a way, like what we were just talking about before, like I've matured a bit. I also probably have ADD and those kinds of things. And so that's mellowed a bit. And I'm able to concentrate and practice things that I probably would have avoided when I was younger. And now I'm kind of more into that aspect of it finding things i can't do and try and figure them out kind of like a puzzle and that's to me at the moment really fun and that's what gets me excited i'm just up at night like how's he doing that or what's the pattern there or like what what how does this work and so in a way it's more fun now in that sense i mean playing in a band is tons of fun don't get me wrong it's amazing and big sh- and like in a band like sum 41 it's awesome because you're in a massive band playing huge shows The struggle is over. We did that at the beginning. It's all running now. That's fun. It does get a bit repetitive because you're just playing the same songs all the time. So the pro to that is the shows are awesome. The con to that is that, you know, sometimes it gets repetitive. Some of those songs I love and I'll, I'll always have fun playing them, like Still Waiting and things like that. I like are just fun. I love that song every time I hear it. But on the flip side doing what I'm doing now is more fun because I'm I'm never really playing the same thing over and over again. I'm always looking for something new. The downside is that the audience is usually just me (laughs) in my basement. So, but that's fine too. I don't care. It's more about the process that I'm I'm into now. But the reason why I started posting stuff is because when the band said that they were stopping after this record cycle... I have one fan, like I have some fans, and I like, you know, which I'm grateful for, but I have one in particular who she's always posting stuff, and her name's uh, Graf Valeria, and uh, that's her uh, Instagram handle. And I mean, I was talking to my wife, and she, we were like, ah, oh, we should probably post a video for her, because when they made the announcement, we were like, she's probably pretty bummed out. So I recorded the first still waiting video, kind of for her. And then, I, you know, so many people were like, that's awesome. And so I kept doing it. And the beauty of social media now is that you can kind of have that outlet, which is great. Because if you are just in your basement doing it by yourself, like, it's just a way to keep yourself honest, actually, you know? And, like, you try and play something that is worthy of a take that you can share is an extra level of, of effort just to make sure you're playing stuff right. So that's kind of how I got into it. So I started playing in 2020 again. But I started posting stuff in 2023, and that's kind of why. I'm really glad you did, because uh, I've always loved the way you play drums, because you're playing like super hard things, but you make them look and sound easy. I don't know how to say that. And that's something I really love in a drummer. So thanks for doing that. Thanks for saying so. I mean, when I look at I mean, here's the thing. When I used to play, I wasn't thinking about technique, and so... My right hand was pretty good, but my left hand was kind of like a club. And I developed tendonitis in my elbow. So what I've been doing in the last couple years is just kind of almost relearning how to at least hold the sticks in a way that still looks like I'm hitting hard and playing the same way, but just holding the sticks in a slightly different way to prevent injury. Because I think as you get older, you have to do that or else it's just not going to work anymore, particularly with this style, which is very fast and hard and heavy, you know, and I've been able with help. I take drum lessons from a guy named Tim Metz and I just kind of been focusing so much on my hands. And again, I'm able to do that now. I think just because I'm a bit older, a little bit more patient and I had that big break. So to come back to something after so long 
and then looking at it and going, oh, wait, this hand sucks. Like, this is a real problem with this hand. And then going, okay, how can I fix that? It takes stepping away for a while and then getting back into it. And then it's, you know, glaringly obvious. So that's kind of the journey, I guess, I'm on now, is I'm trying to be the drummer now that I wish I was then. Cool. Yeah, that's like a journey of personal growth. I love it. And I was going to ask you this, so it's perfect. Uh, what did playing drums teach you in life? Like, is having something to practice and study daily helpful for you? Well, I think if you can keep a level head, it's like really good at humbling you. Because <laughs> if you watch other people, like don't get a huge ego because there's always somebody better. And so like anytime I'm like, that was amazing. Like I'll see somebody else and go, oh wait, I'm not quite there yet. Just like, okay, you got a ways to go, dude. Like, but if you just chip at it consistently over time, you will get better. Like it's not an overnight thing. It takes a long time because they're sometimes like tiny little muscles you're, you're training. Like it's in muscles that you wouldn't normally use. So it takes a really long time. I remember reading, I think it's Travis Barker. I'm not sure. I saw a quote by Travis and he was like, drumming is my meditation. And I never thought of it that way before until nowadays. Like sometimes I, you can really zone in on what's happening in your hands. Like not just the sticks, but like literally what's happening with your fingers inside your hand. And if you can kind of imagine this part of your hand when you're doing it, it's there's some, me I don't meditate, but that's as close to it as I get. And it is relaxing in a way. <laughs> So, I mean, there's that aspect, too. Yeah, that, and that's huge, actually. My sister-in-law is, like, is a therapist. And we went to visit her. I can't remember what she called it, but we were all in a hotel room. My kids were acting nuts, and they weren't listening, and my wife was really stressed out. My sister-in-law was sitting there, and I just stood up in the chaos. I didn't. I guess I didn't help, but I stood up, and I just got my sticks, and I started just, like, practicing. I can't remember what she called it. It was kind of a way to block out the noise and really focus. And so that's helped. I think for anyone, anything, it doesn't need to be music. Some people do it with fitness or whatever. If there's a thing that you're into that you can get like uh, better at in incremental stages, it's good for your like personal wellness. It's like gardening. Music is like gardening. I'm probably not the first person that's made that analogy but you plant the seed and then you kind of prune the shrub and blah 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 and it turns into a tree i know that's not how trees work but you know you're constantly tending to it and then eventually it grows into this great thing and so i think in many ways the same kind of mental exercise can be applied to music and studying an instrument to gardening if you're into that to physical fitness if you're into that and it's all beneficial if you approach it the right way Some people get really stressed out and frustrated. And I think that's just because they're impatient. You kind of have to accept that you're not going to get to the end result. I mean, I'm, I'm still working on my hands. I've been playing the drums for 30 years. And I'll watch somebody who's an expert master, like Dave Weckl or something. And he's like, I'm still working on that left hand. Like, it never ends. You're going to forever be doing it. And so if you can get into that, then I think it's good for your overall you know, self-betterment. But if you're just like, I wish my hands were fast now, you're going to end up hurting your hands and just go into physio and then you won't be able to play for five weeks because you have to rest or whatever. It forces you to like do things in a different way, to try to improve yourself and what you're doing. So yeah, I, I love it. Talking about playing three bands or artists, you would like to play with anyone dead or alive I mean, can I play as good as, as, am I just me or can I be as good as the, like, the person? <laughs> yeah, you can. Totally. I saw, I mean, first of all, somebody posted Metallica playing in Moscow in like 1991, right after the wall fell. Classic. I haven't seen that video in forever, but now like when you're older and you've got a little bit more understanding of some history or whatever, like the energy in the audience just must have been absolutely bananas. So I would say I'd play that show. I'd just play that show. That'd be good. Um, another one, 
would be like, okay, then these are just random. Another one would be, uh, the other day I was with my friend. I have a friend in Palm Springs, actually older than my dad, but he's a buddy of mine, Randy. And we were watching like old videos on YouTube and it was Sam and Dave, the soul group, Sam and Dave. And it was like live in France, 1960 something. And I was like, I, that would be fun. I'd want to be in that band at that time doing that kind of thing. Like some kind of Motown thing in the 60s would be awesome. And then another one just randomly, just for an old one, is I was recently watching uh, for a jazzy thing. I was watching Oscar Peterson Trio. I don't know if you know who that is, but... Wow. Canadian piano player. And it's him. I can't remember the name of the bass player. The drummer's this guy, Ed Thigpen, and they're live. I think it's live in Denmark in like 1960. That would be fun. Because I've always had this, like, I think it'd be fun to be in like a jazz trio or something. And that would be fun. Because I love Miles and I love, you know, Coltrane and a lot of that bebop stuff. But some of it's like a little bit hard to listen to. Whereas Oscar Peterson just sounds fun. Like all the time. So that, I'll pick those three just randomly because they popped in my head. I went from Metallica in Moscow to Oscar Peterson in Denmark. Perfect. <laughs> I mean, it's a perfect range of styles. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so let's pick those three. And then maybe tomorrow it would be three completely different answers. And that show with Metallica, ACDC played that too, which is just, like, would have been bananas. Yeah, crazy. Let's pick those ones. Great. That's a great answer. Sounds like so much fun. So uh, do you have any plans of putting up a band or starting any musical project or it's just not something you're thinking about? No, what I'd like to do is is continue with the drums and figure out a way to do that. Like, I see other people online doing stuff like that. I don't know if it's going to be live streams or lessons or whatever. I just like to get into that world a bit more because that's what I'm, I'm enjoying. If a cool band came and said, hey, we need somebody to fill in or whatever, or we're going to this play like the last tour i did was with the vandals and i love those guys if they asked me to play a bathroom stall i'd do it but they asked me to go to hawaii and i was like that'd be fun let's do that they asked me to go to europe this was the last show was probably 2018 and that was fun just because it was fun to go to europe so if it was a cool band or somebody going to a cool place i'd do it but as of now, I don't have any plans for that. What I'd like to do is just more online stuff. So my YouTube channel, which has one subscriber and no videos, but I'll start uploading full covers. and Because people have been saying, we want full covers, we want this, with that. So I think that'll be here. It's what's there. Stevo 32 drums on YouTube. And then on Instagram, it's the Stevo 32 And that's probably where I'll be for the most part. I've tried some of these other apps. I don't know how they work. I'm getting too old to learn all the new stuff. So those are the two I know. Instagram, YouTube. But right now, when we're filming this in December, there's nothing on the YouTube. There's one subscriber and it's my friend because I said, hey, what do you think of this for the YouTube channel name? And he said, it's not very original, but I just subscribed. So there you go. That's how I have one. But it's not ready <laughs> yet. It's coming. Okay, yeah, anyway, looking forward to it. So, great. Uh, one last thing I got to ask real quick before the last question is Fat Leap. This has been like a thing on Instagram and the social media in general, like minute, two and 16 seconds. Do you say the dentist said my mom should have had an abortion or the doctor said my mom should have had an abortion because the lyric booklet says doctor, but I hear dentist. And I want to thank Chris DeMakes for bringing this up in his podcast, which, by the way, you should all go check out. So, I mean, it was so long ago that I just don't remember. <laughs> I'm not going to give... I actually really sense. enjoy the fact that this has become some weird thing. So I can't say one way or the other. I'm not sure. I would say, this is what I'd say. If you're going to the dentist to get an abortion, it's time to get a new dentist. That's what I will say. But I don't 100% <laughs> remember what the line is. 
if like I can't remember what I said on the day. Okay, yeah, I had to ask. I had to try. So <laughs> I did. The final question is suggest as a song, a book, and a movie. They don't have to be your favorites, but just stuff you enjoy. Just the first things that come to your mind. One of each? Oh yeah. <laughs> or maybe two of each if you prefer. I mean, see, the thing is, I'm kind of like an upbeat person, but I just consume so much bad things, like, constantly. Uh, my wife is like, how can you read that? So I love history, and that's kind of all I read about, really. So, I, and, <laughs> so I'll, give you, I'll give you a couple. And these don't have anything to do with music, because I don't actually read about music at all. Um, although for drummers, I could offer a drum book that I recommend. I could do that. A drum book yes. that I recommend that has really done great things for my hands is a rudimental marching book called The All American Drummer by Charlie Wilcox. And it's an old book. It's probably from the 40s. But it basically takes all the rudiments and it puts them together in these sort of musical phrases. And there's 150 solos in the book. But they're pretty easy. They're only a few bars long. So I'll, for any drummer who wants to work on their hands, I would recommend that book if you can read the music. Uh, if you can't read the music, there's a website by a drummer called J.P. Bouvet that I'd recommend called the RhythmBot app. I think it's RhythmBot.app. And it, you can sort of follow along and see the notation written on the screen and then hear the drum that plays back and you can slowly figure it out. That's how I learned. And I have a drum teacher. But I'd recommend that for a music book. If anybody, a drum book, specifically drum book. If you want to work on your hands, play nice and loose because I played tight forever and I almost wrecked my arm. For a book that's not, I like history, so the... uh I'm, I'll just tell you what I'm reading now. I'm reading Stalingrad by Anthony Beaver because I like war books. <laughs> and then his other book, Berlin, which I read before, is a great book. If you like nonfiction books. <laughs> the most recent movie I saw is the most dark war movie I think I've ever seen. It's a Belarusian movie called Come and See. Uh, if you like really dark um, World War Two era movies, this is like takes the cake. It's in Russian, so you know you have to enjoy reading one with subtitles. You can watch it on Internet Archive. I think it might even be on YouTube. But again, these are things that people might be like. I thought he'd like American Pie. Like I, I kind of don't watch stuff like that. I'll be like, what's the weird thing? Come and see the last really good movie I watched. That those two books. Why not? And then. What was I listening to today? Just randomly, because I love, and it'll bum everybody out if you don't like jazz, but I was just listening to, because uh, I like this drummer named Tony Williams. If you don't know him, he's a jazz drummer. He played with Miles Davis. And there's a song, like even if you don't like jazz, you can listen to his ride cymbal and just be blown away at how good it is. So check out Walkin, W-A-L-K-I-N, Miles Davis, four and more. It's a live record. It's just blazingly fast. I was just listening to that a minute ago because I was like, what is he doing? How is he doing that? I want to be able to do that. And I'm nowhere close to being able to do that. But just randomly, those are the three I'm going to suggest. These might all be suggestions that people go, why would I even bother with any of that shit? But that's what I listen to. That's what I read. And that's what I watch. Thanks for all the suggestions. Thanks for talking. Thanks for taking the time, Steve. -o. I really appreciate it, and it was a great pleasure. Hold right. on, I was going to say happy holidays, but we're in March. <laughs> you can say happy Easter if you want. Happy Easter. There you go. Happy Easter to everyone. Perfect. You know, people who don't celebrate Easter, just have a good week. Sounds good. So... <laughs> Yeah, so thanks again and go follow Steve on Instagram and YouTube. See what he's up to because uh, seeing him playing drums is such a pleasure we all deserve. If you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with your friends and loved ones. And why not with your enemies as well? And make sure to check out the other episodes. I've been talking with a lot of amazing people like Mike Herrera from MXPX, Bill Stevenson from The Descendants and Black Flag. Eric Melvin from NoFX, Laura Jane Grace 
from Against Me, Joe Lally from Fugazi, Matt Pryor from The Get Up Kids, and many, many more. So go check them out. And yeah, see you in the next episode. Ciao, ciao.